Women often share with me that it seems that relationships are more important to women than it seems they are to men. From your perspective, are relationships just as important to men? And if so or not, why or why not? Uh, definitely relationships are more important to women. Uh, love is found through relationship, but love also... Uh, men are interest, just as interested in love as women, but they don't know it. If you go to a bookstore, you'll see uh, actually more men buy books uh, on relationship than women, but they're different kind of relationship books. They're called How to Make Money, How to Be Successful. So mm. any guy who's trying to make money, he's doing it so that one day he will be loved by a woman. That's the bottom line. So men are driven by love just as much, but they don't, they don't see uh, their relationship skills as, a, as the way to have more love. They see buying a house, buying a car, having a good job, making money uh, as the way to get love. And then you're in a relationship to get that love. Whereas women particularly see relationship as the means to get love. Because the truth is men don't care that much how much money you make. Okay, you do <laughs> as a woman. So women are looking for men who can provide for them in some way. And men are looking for women who will appreciate what they can provide. That's the mm -hmm. bottom line. Now, mm -hmm. this is not just me talking. We can say all oh, that's socialization. And that is socialization without a doubt. But it's based on biology. The biology of success is you produce the hormone testosterone when you feel I can do it myself. I'm successful. And for both men and women, testosterone gets produced. But men only bond with women when their testosterone goes up in her presence. Uh, women do not bond with men when your testosterone goes up in his presence. Women bond when their estrogen goes up. And men bond with women when their estrogen goes up. And estrogen is produced through relationship, always through relationship, where you are interdependent on somebody. So when you depend on someone for something and they provide that for you, your estrogen goes up. So it's very hard for you know, a woman who's independent uh, to feel enough estrogen to fall in love with a man. She, mm -hmm. she recognizes, I need relationship. And I'll, I'll put it on a two-tier level. Uh, the question is about, do women value relationship more than men? Yes. And do women need love more than men? No, we both need love. But women are aware of their need for love and not so much walking around being aware of their need for sex. Whereas men walk around feeling their need for sex and it's through sex that he actually feels love and gets the love he needs, although he doesn't know that. Uh, same thing for women when they say, oh, I need love. They don't know that <laughs> they need love so they can feel sexual. Uh, it's sexuality is where you bring God into your body. It's divinity. It's ex ecstasy. But women don't go around with a longing for sex, generally speaking. We're talking majority. Uh, they go around a longing for love. Men don't feel the longing for love. They feel the longing for sex. But sex is the doorway for them to love. But they're not conscious of that because we're not fully yet conscious beings until you have it. Once you know that uh, sex brings you love, then you suddenly, it's part of the maturing process for a man, and not all men get there, is that I want sex only so I can feel the love in my heart on a, on a greater level. That's why it's actually called making love. You increase the love that you feel through having sex if you're a man. And for a woman, you will also increase the love you feel if you have sex, but you have to first have the love, then the sex, and then it will grow. So if we want to grow in love, which I'll just say was my theme of today, I did a Facebook Live. People can check me out on Facebook as well, all about growing in love. Mm. So I want to ask one little follow-up question before I ask the next official question. Would that be okay? Sure. Oh, yes, please. When you say that men are out there buying more relationship books than women, but they come in the form of business books or making money kind of books or success kind of books, I'd like to understand a little bit more about what's underneath that. Like, does a man feel like he has to have reached a certain level of success to attract the woman that he wants or what's going on? Say a little more about that if you would. Okay. Well, quite often, if a woman makes more money than a man, there's, just, there's an intimidation factor. 
Uh, he wants to feel that he has something of value to offer her. And you feel that you have more confidence that you have something to value, uh, offer her. If you are successful, if you make a lot of money, if you've got a good job, if you've got a home, uh, we're very much aware that these are important to women. And so if we don't have confidence in ourselves that we can provide something of value to her, we just don't even uh, bother. And we won't, certainly don't want to be in a committed relationship um, unless, and here's the catch. See, everything's changing now because so many women listening probably make more money than a lot of men. And there's her challenge, which is does she, does she respect and appreciate a man who doesn't make as much money as her? There's a, there's a place there. Uh, some women don't. Um, and some women are perfectly fine with that because that's becoming more of the norm, very common today. And so why does she need him? That's the whole thing for women to learn. They have to open up and recognize that, you know, once you get above a certain level of, of, of uh, financial support in your life, whether you're making the money or your partner's making the money, you shift into another consciousness of, the primary fulfillment need is emotional support. So a woman has to be keyed into recognizing that, yeah, she's successful, she has money, but it's no fun, or she's tired of doing everything herself uh, without companionship, and she needs affection, she needs uh, warmth, she needs communication, she needs uh, sharing time, she needs uh, understanding. See, these are needs inside, and but. You know, it's not a solution unless she can feel that need to be heard, the need to be touched inside, seen, and, uh, and then eventually into the need for sex, physical intimacy. So intimacy is a very profound need. The problem is need is something you have to feel. And if you're making, if you're very independent, often you don't feel your needs because being independent tends to trigger the hormone testosterone and testosterone tends to lower estrogen. And the research shows that when your estrogen levels are low, you don't feel, uh, they don't actually say you, they, you don't feel your needs. That's me reading into it. What the research shows is that affection has little effect on your hormones if your estrogen levels are low. If your estrogen levels are high, then a little affection will bump them twice as high. So it's literally, you, you've got to prime the pump first to get your estrogen up to where then a man's romantic gestures have a big impact on you. So if your estrogen levels are low, you can't fall in love. And, and when you fall in love, I bring her those beautiful flowers behind you, she blooms, you know, she will go, oh, these beautiful flowers. But if your estrogen is low and someone brings you flowers, you go, so what, you know, I can buy my own flowers. That's, she's reacting then like a man, a testosterone man. So there's certain sensitivities that you become aware of as your estrogen levels start to rise that aren't there. And that sensitivity is being feeding, feeling I need support. And now we have the research that shows that uh, estrogen levels go up whenever you're in a situation, a relationship, either a business relationship, medical relationship, teacher-student relationship, intimate relationship, where you are dependent on someone to help you in some way. So, you know, for a lot of very independent women, help is, I don't need any help. I can do it myself. Well, why would I need help? Yeah, you need help on an emotional level to feel safe. Okay, so you physically, you can feel safe. You can make money. You can hire guards. You can take judo classes, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah, you have policemen around. So what do we need a man for? For women, we need a man to feel emotionally safe. Okay, so that's the safety to express who you are, to be your authentic self, and know that someone will love you the way you are. Now, that in itself is an unrealistic ideal that somebody's going to just love you just the way you are if you don't edit yourself. Editing yourself doesn't mean you can't be authentic. It means expressing yourself in a way where a man can hear you. And I presume that your questions that we'll continue to look at will get into that as how to communicate so men will listen as opposed to how to communicate so that men will lose interest in you or get defensive or become angry. What do you do at those times? You can sabotage a relationship or you can nourish the relationship.
Yeah, yeah. Some of my questions are centered around that. I just want to make one comment to put the exclamation point of what you just said there, John. I think sometimes when women hear this word need and being in touch with their needs, I agree with you. That's so, so important because how can we expect a man to like read our minds? We can't. It's not going to work. But a but lot of women, I think, hear that as neediness. And I just want to say there's a big distinction, right? There, there's a big distinction. And, and you framed it, which is true, which is um, what you said. But a bigger part of this is for the woman to discover within herself these needs and to feel them. To access your loneliness is not a is not a um, friendly feeling. I'd mm -hmm. rather be busy. To access a feeling, why doesn't anybody love me? Uh, that's called feeling unworthy. Uh, you, you can go, but look, I'm so beautiful. I look what I can do. Look what I've accomplished. Of course, I'm worthy. But inside, there's a deep feeling inside there. Often, a feeling inadequate, unworthy, afraid, vulnerable that we don't want to access because on the other side of that feeling, and it's not that you are unworthy or inadequate, but on the other side of that feeling is I need love. And if I'm not getting love, it's too painful to feel that need for love and we push it down. But the mind does all kinds of says, well, why don't you get love? What's wrong with you? And so forth. Well, we push that down. So a lot of this is work that women have to do on themselves to explore vulnerability and well, we might just say they're non-reasonable emotions, okay? They're, they're non-rational emotions. They're what Freud says is they're irrational. Uh, basically, all negative emotions, to a great extent, are irrational. You know, the world's a great place. We're wonderful people, you know? And you can feel, I need love, and feel, and feel confident I'm going to get it and be happy that, oh, I need love, and look at all the opportunities. Or you could be in a fight or flight response. I need love and there's no one of my age that wants me. I'm too old or I can't find the right guy or all the good guys are taken. That's your brain going into a bias of fear, looking at pessimism. And you can see this in the brain. Uh, they can see brain scans. When you're being pessimistic, it goes to the right part of the brain up here. And when you're being optimistic, it's uh, going to the left side of your brain, which is, you know, it, right up here, you'll see blood flow when you think, oh, I can have, I'm a, oh, look at that, that's a possibility, that's a possibility, that's a possibility, or this part of the brain, oh, that's not a possibility. And generally speaking, it's when you're living in this bias that uh, you can't have it. And that's, these are deep-seated beliefs inside of ourselves that maybe we're not aware of. And they keep us from feeling, I need love, and, and uh, feeling, I need a man. And you know, the way the culture is today, it was so easy in the past to go, I need a man because I can't, I don't have a job. I got babies. So I needed a man. But now I don't, I got, I got a job. I can make money and I don't have babies anymore. So why do I need a man? Well, you need love and a man can provide that love. But you also then need to know skills to get it because men don't know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and so now I want to talk about some of those skills and get some of your advice on that. So this is kind of a gateway question that I think will lead into some of that. We often hear as women that men want to please women and that even sometimes they want to be like our heroes, right? But what would you say to the women out there who hear that and they haven't necessarily experienced men in that way? That's usually the, one, of the, one of the reasons why we have this bias towards pessimism is because we didn't experience it when we were children. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have a mother who was adoring your father and a father who was kind and loving you, it's hard to trust men. And one of the symptoms of that is always being sexually attracted to the wrong men. That's just the biology of it. I've got a long explanation of the biology to explain it, but the, the pattern is if you, if you don't have role models of men who are trustworthy and you don't have a role model of a mother who believe that men are trustworthy, it's harder for you to trust men. And so part of you deep down inside wants to sort of please the man to get that love to excessively please the man to get that love, become what he wants you to be. And of course, every man wants a woman to say, oh, I want to have sex with you. So your body just becomes all excited sexually in the presence of the wrong man. And what that means, if that has ever happened to you, it doesn't happen to everybody. It's, it's this wound inside that needs to be healed. The way you heal it is you get love from the right man. 
Now you can't change your father, but you can find a man out there who can give you the right love, but that man will always be a man who doesn't turn you on sexually. So that's where you need to be in a relationship with the man who pursues you more than you pursue him. That way it doesn't activate this childlike part of you that will give the man what he wants and instead look for how to get what you want. And while that sounds selfish, that is the dynamic of a successful relationship. A man feels successful in providing what you want. He can't ever be successful doing that if you don't know what you want and what you need and can communicate in a way that works for him to teach him. You see, men are teachable. Now, you don't say that they don't want you to be their teacher, but they're, they're trainable. You as women are not trainable. You're teachable if you have a teacher that you think is good but you're not, not generally not by your spouse, are you teachable? But men are trainable by their spouse. So, you know, if a man is with a woman who doesn't know how to love, it's kind of hopeless for him to change her. But women, you can change men by training them. You're not really changing him. You're controlling him without control. You're training him, just like you would do a dog, basically. You, you ask for things, small requests, sit, and he gets a big reward. He learns to sit in your presence. It's a journey. Now, let's say he's already trained. That means he had a dad who provided for his mother and was very successful at that. Those guys are rare. And because in the father's generation, the skills that men had then were the skills who made money to please a woman. Okay, so that's all he had to do. My dad made money, not a whole lot, but he was more successful than most around the neighborhood. So that was a prize. Uh, my, my, my mother had seven children. She's busy raising children most of her life. <laughs> and he provided for her and that's all she needed from him. And then he felt love from her, you see, and they had sex and she loved him. And that was because he provided something. Women have to be in a situation where someone is providing for them something of value to them. Then their estrogen levels go up. And as estrogen goes up, you can fall in love. As estrogen goes up, you can feel a healthy kind of love. There's unhealthy love and there's healthy love. There is. Unhealthy love is, I must have him, I'll do whatever he wants I'll, to get him. That's not healthy love. Healthy love is he loves me and I, I'm so lucky to find him and it's so great he found me. <laughs> and, and what a wonderful relationship this is because he's, he listens to me, he cares about me, he's kind and gentle, he has a good job, he works hard, he'll do things that he doesn't even like to do for me. He does all these sacrifices with a smile. It's amazing. He carries heavy things. He does dirty, dirty jobs outside and doesn't complain. He doesn't whine. Find a guy like that. Well, you're not going to, generally speaking, unless you train him. And you train him by appreciating. It's like a, any training. You, you, you ask what you want and you get a reward. They'll do more of that. And when you train a dog, if you yell at the dog, you'll get less. That's old-fashioned training. If you say to a dog, uh, Men are not just dogs, of course, but these are, I have to say our relationship got better after Bonnie learned dog training school. Um, the, the teacher taught us that um, if dog is jumping up on you, how to train them to not jump up on you is to not say bad dog. My wife used to say bad dog, bad dog, dog just kept doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly don't hit the dog. Then you kill the dog. I mean, if you hit the dog, they might learn a lesson, but you suppress who they are. Their aliveness goes away. You can see traumatized dogs and there's no spark. You know, my dogs are jumping up and down at 15 years old, like little puppies. They stay alive. So, cause they're not punished. So what you do to train the dog not to jump up on you is simply when they jump up on you, turn around the other direction, ignore them for a few minutes, for a few moments, ignore them. And if they keep jumping up on you, then gently, slowly walk away. They get no attention, no attention on negative behavior. And then as soon as they stop jumping up on you, then you turn around and you say, sit, and you give them a reward. So what you've just done is shifted from focusing on a negative behavior to giving them a positive behavior that you reward. And this is called positive reinforcement, which is true of all species, including men. Mm -hmm. So, so what are some of the ways that we can give that kind of positive reinforcement and what are some of the kinds of ways that we can use the language we can use that helps a man to hear in a way that he's more able and willing to respond? You're right. That makes sense. What a good idea. Brilliant. Oh, that's so helpful. I'll say it again. You're right. Oh, what a good idea. Oh, that makes sense. 
Oh, brilliant. That is so helpful. I didn't know that. Thank you. So that's called appreciation and acknowledgement, appreciation, and acknowledgement. Now that is not going to be real unless you need a man. <laughs> See, vulnerability is not just, oh, I'm crying about something, although you might. Vulnerability is also feeling appreciation. Vulnerability is simply being in a state where you recognize I depend on this person for something. So you cry when you depend on them for something and they're not there. And you, you smile when you depend on them for something and they're there. So walking into the house, there's a big smile. You mentioned one of the confusions for women. And it is very, I've seen this 30 years. It's when I talk about women need to need, be aware of their needs, feel their needs, and allow a man to provide for them what they need. And now it's on an emotional level because physical, they can do it all themselves. Is I come home and my wife, we're having a party and my, we define our jobs for the party. She wants my help. You're going to get the drinks. You're going to put up the decorations. Okay. So I come home at seven o'clock. The party starts at seven and I arrive late because I'm working or whatever. And there's no drinks. There's no ice and there's no uh, banners up, no celebration decorations. And I come in the house, she says, you're late, you're late. The party's already started, I had to do it myself. Okay, and we still don't have drinks and she's all upset at me. Well, that's, that's called needy. That's I needed you and you weren't there for me. Now here's the flip side of that, which she became a master of, which is I come home late and she goes, oh, you're here, you're here. Oh, we have time for the decorations and the drinks. Would you go to the store and get those drinks and ice now? I say, sure, I'll go get them now. First, she doesn't do it herself. Second, she still lets me do the job. And three, I get the same reward. No punishment. That's okay. how you train First, a man. First, she doesn't do it herself. Say that again. First, she doesn't do it herself. Second, you do it. I do. She asked me to do it. She's, yep. she, she's happy to see me and then asks me to do part of it or whatever can still be done. You know, go get the drinks and this. And then I come home and I say, I'll put up the decorations too. She says, okay. And so, then you get the appreciation and acknowledgement for doing it. As if... I did it the first time without being late. You just have to get punishment does not work with men. Disapproval does not work with men. Uh, criticism does not work with men. Withholding sex does not work with men. Withholding feelings does not work with men. Withholding your positive feelings. See, women punish men all the time. Oh, well, you should know that if you do that, you're gonna get a cold, cold B. And that's punishment. That's manipulation. That's control. Any control pushes a man away. Now let's turn that around. Do you as women want a man to control your feelings and tell you you shouldn't feel that way? That doesn't make sense. You're irrational. You're complaining too much. You're too negative. Why can't you love me more? He's basically criticizing or trying to change your feelings. You don't want that. Well, men have the sensitivity, particularly around their behaviors, making our behaviors wrong. And you can always say, well, how do, how do I get what I want if I can't make his behavior wrong? How do I let him know? I mean, two monkeys, one monkey steps on the foot of the other. The other monkey doesn't have language skills. So the only thing the monkey can do is go, bah, 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 make a big loud noise. Right. And if the big loud noise doesn't do it, then you step on his foot back. <laughs> That's called revenge, getting even, bah, 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 big noises and stepping on foot. This is how we do as humans. I have to say that, you know, women typically want to first teach him a lesson, and then, then they'll get into revenge. But uh, men tend to go to revenge first. But uh, women have this nurturing side. Well, I have to teach him, I have to show him. If he does that, then he won't get this. <laughs> but this is monkey behavior. It doesn't work with humans, and particularly if you want to have a loving, passionate relationship. You have to have these new skills of not punishing, of not shaming, of not disapproving, of not manipulating, not trying to change his behaviors. But what you can do is your biggest force is keep coming back to love, appreciating, accepting, and trusting he's doing his best. Appreciating. You ask for concrete things. I gave you some words. Then I gave you an example of, of not punishing, but giving him a chance to succeed. You know, sometimes I'll say something wrong. And, and when in the beginning of the marriage, she said, oh, no, you already said that. You can't change it. I said, why? Why can't you let me change it? I see I made a mistake. I, I take that back. I said it wrong or I don't really mean that. No, no, you said it. You mean it. You mean it. Okay, you want to suffer. You can continue to suffer and get less and less. You got to like go with the flow. People make mistakes. Let them self-correct. Give them rewards for self-correcting. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's sometimes like, do, would you rather be right or would you rather have love or would you rather feel good in a relationship, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, that's a cliche, which is, would you rather have love or being right? And it's true, but there's a lot more to that because there's this whole thing about control. You know, we're trying to change our partners. If you, I'm basically clear, there's no doubt everybody wants more. There's nothing wrong with wanting more, which means your partner's going to change. But it's not your job to change them. Your partner, your job is to communicate successfully what you want more of at the right time in the right way. Mm -hmm. And have plenty of reward for him. And what is that reward? It's your appreciation. It's your overlooking his mistakes. It's your giving him a chance to learn again by trusting he's going to do his best and eventually you'll get more. Yeah. Anytime you don't trust a man, you're punching him in the stomach. And how many times do you not even ask a man to do something for you because you're afraid he won't do it? That means you're not trusting him. Right. You, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't trust a man, men just back off. It's the most refreshing thing for someone to need you. You can't need someone, by the way, if you don't trust them. You see, if, you, if I need your love and I don't trust you'll give it, I'll stop needing it. That's just human nature. Well, I can't get it from you. I'll need it from someone else. Or I just don't need it. That's yeah. another denial thing we do is we deny our needs. It's the old Aesop's fable. The old Aesop's fable is the fox who wants the grapes and runs to get the grapes, excited to get the grapes, imagines eating the grapes, and then there's a big fence and he can't jump over it. So he says, oh, I don't want those grapes anyway. They're probably sour. Sour grapes. That's the old story. Sour grapes. Sour grapes. Yeah. We just well, say, oh, I don't want it. I don't care about it. And men do it too. You know, we get rejected by our wives with an I don't care. I don't love her. Men go into, I don't care. Women go, then I don't need him. Can't trust him. Men go into, why well, I don't care. No matter what I do, it doesn't make her happy. Why bother? And this is not who we are. This is who we become when our heart is not open. And that's just that we don't get the love and support everyone we need. Men just need a different kind of love. Women need a different kind of love, more caring, more understanding, and more respect. Yeah. So coming back to a dating situation and how a woman might ask a man for something that she wants, let's just say a man says, so what do you want to do? Which is a question, you know, that sometimes makes us cringe because we're like, we don't want to be the ones that have to come up with all the ideas. But let's just say there are some things that would be fun to do. What's the best way for us to ask for a man in a way that he can respond where he still gets to provide something of value for us? So that's well, the you, you, you gave a, a kind of a double question there. You said a guy says, what do you want to do? That's the typical guy thing. Okay, what right, do you want right. to do? You should always have three things that you want to do. That's your job. Your job is to have three things. He doesn't know what you want to do. So what do you want to do? Now, it certainly would be better if he thought of three things and said, oh, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. What do you want to do? Uh, that would be nice, but he's not going to do that. He's not trained to do that. He doesn't know the value of that. He doesn't know that that's winning the lottery if you do that. So <laughs> what you what you have to train him, okay, is he says, uh, what do you want? Say, hey, uh, let's get together next week. What do you want to do? And you say, well, you know, there's lots of things that make me happy. Uh, we, could, uh, we could do this, uh, we could do that, and we could do that. And don't ask him what he wants to do. Don't need to. The date, a romantic date, is he provides for you what you want. And he will feel most successful and bond with you more if he provides what you want. Now, if he says, well, let's go watch this football game and you're not into it, then you'd basically say, I'm not really into football, but you can go with your friends. These are some things that I like. And you sort out the, the jerks from the good guys. And there's a lot of good guys that go, oh, wow, a woman knows what she wants. Oh, I'll take you to this place. I'll do that for you. Your job is to do three things. And then you basically say, you pick. Then he gets to pick. And if he gets to pick, he gets credit for taking you. You don't want to tell him what to do. That's the whole thing. That's why in the beginning you said you cringe when he says, you know, what do you want to do? You don't want to say what you want to do. And by, why do you not want to say what you want, even if you do? Why? I'll let you first answer the question, and then I'll answer it too. Because, but, we, because we want to feel like he's providing something for us. We don't want to be in charge. We want that's to right. provide that experience for us. Yeah. And now I'll go to a deeper level is you don't want to take responsibility for the potential of him rejecting you and say, I don't want to do that. And you don't want to feel the pressure that if we do what you want to do, 
that, and he says, okay, I'll do that. You don't want to feel the pressure that if he doesn't like it, you're going to feel bad the whole time. Nobody wants to feel that pressure. And men don't want to feel that pressure either. That's why they're saying to you, what do you want to do? <laughs> He's chickening out too. Nobody <laughs> wants to feel the pressure of if it doesn't turn out, whose fault is it? So that's why this is a win-win situation. You've got three things that he already knows. Oh, she likes it. And of course, the other aspect of why you want him to provide for you is that if he provides for you, if it comes from him, then you don't feel pressure and you feel he's providing for you and he's not, and you're not controlling him. Because see, ultimately, even though women do so much all the time to control men, although they may not think they do, I could explain that later if you have that question, but they do so much to control men, they don't want to feel that they're controlling because being controlling is not loving. But women, the biggest complaint men have about women is complaining, criticizing, and controlling. And most women know that they complain too much. Most women know that they can be too critical. But most women are not aware that they're controlling. And that's the biggest issue for men is women controlling. So what would that be? How do you to understand? Imagine that you, you really really want a man to do something for you. Let me see if I can do this right. I do it from my man's point of view. I'm trying to turn it around from a woman's point of view. And let's say, let's say you, you really, really want to please your husband, okay? You want to please this man. You want to be so good to this man. And, but if ever you're disappointed about something, uh, he gets very upset. So you're in this relationship and you always want to please him and you don't want to upset him but you feel disappointed about something, but you can't be disappointed about something. You're feeling controlled, right? right. You want to feel controlled? Isn't that controlling? Because he, he's demanding you to be a certain way. Then see, it's better for me to give this example uh, from the man's point of view. The number one thing that makes men happier is your happiness. So when you say, this doesn't make me happy, then everything inside of him says, okay, then I have to adjust myself in order to make you happy. And if that doesn't make you happy, then I have to adjust myself to make you happy. So that's what men's basic need is in a relationship, is to feel needed by you, to provide for your needs. Your basic need is not to feel needed by a man, although you think it is, okay? Because you think if he needs me, he won't leave me. No. If you need him, he won't leave you. Just that's the truth. If, if you need him, he won't leave you. But if he needs you, you think, oh, if he needs me, then he loves me. What he needs, this is a little funny with words here, but what he needs is to feel you need him and he's successful at providing what you need. Then you'll never lose him. Okay. But then you, what happens is women get into this place of, well, does he need me? Does he not need me? If he doesn't need me, he will, he, he'll leave me. Well, on one level, that's true. He does need something. But what he needs is for you to feel you need him. And why does he need that? Because you can't love him unless you need him. You can love him like a child, but that's not what he wants. Right. You can be his mother. That's not what you want. That's not what he wants. For him to feel like a man and have physical intimacy and adult love, he needs to feel he is providing something of value and meaningfulness to you. And so you have to feel, I need it. You have to feel like we all need food. A simple example of this is our need for food. If you go for two days without food, no matter what you eat, it's going to taste good. Right. I love this. I love this. I love this. Doesn't have to be some great dessert or whatever. <laughs> the bagel with cream cheese, and you go, ah, oh, delicious. Okay, so this is feeling your need for something allows you to feel appreciation and love. Without feeling the need, you can't feel this kind of love, which is the kind of love that men need, which is to appreciate what he offers, to accept what he who he is, even though he's not perfect and the trust he's doing his best, and the trust that his intent is to be there for you, even though he can't always be there for you. Those are key things. And you know what women will tend to do is he, he doesn't, he's in one bad mood, or he doesn't do one thing right or whatever, and she goes, oh, I can't trust him. That's called all or nothing. No, you can't trust him to be perfect all the time. These are like words we need to remind ourselves. Okay, yeah, I can't trust him to be perfect all the time, but I can trust him. And look at all the wonderful things I've got from him and I can get from him and I will get from him. That's being optimistic. That's using a part of your brain. But if you're in fight or flight, 
meaning your body's making adrenaline or cortisol. Your body goes into this brain bias of focusing on negativity. And you can't get out of it until you get your stress levels down. And you can't get your stress levels down if you're a woman until you start reading, until you do things without depending on a man. Okay, this is the key. You have to do things not depending on the man to raise your estrogen levels so that then you can depend on a man and have a big reaction. Because you're not going to get a big reaction. He's not going to do something. The big reaction is actually feeling a lot of appreciation. You know, they found that when women's estrogen levels are low, that if you give a flower, it doesn't do anything. If your estrogen levels are high, you can give her 50 flowers, it will go higher. You give her one rose, it will go higher. Same effect if your estrogen levels at a healthy level. And I know many women listening, their estrogen levels are just low and it's part of getting older. But no, it's normal for them to go lower than when you were younger. But the problem is balance. You still can make enough estrogen even if it's not as high as it used to be because you're not making eggs, okay? You're not dropping eggs, so your body doesn't need to make a baby, so it doesn't need such high estrogen levels. It still can have plenty of estrogen to fall in love if she's in balance with estrogen and progesterone and not too much testosterone. Testosterone lowers her estrogen, and it's more crucial as she gets older to make sure she's developed the skills of depending on others to get what she needs instead of being jaded where I can't trust others. I have to do it myself. And maybe in certain areas you do have to do it yourself. That's okay. As long as you're anticipating other areas of your life, like gardening, like your children, like singing, being in groups, going shopping, you know, where you're depending on other cooking, other things that can make you happy. This is your hobbies, the things you need to do in order to be happy. So you're depending on that. And of course, your doctor visits, that's always a good your therapist or coach. These are all people you depend upon. Take classes where you're depending on a teacher. Go to a yoga class or aerobics class where you have somebody leading you. Go to dance classes. You know, you can get partners in a dance class and they'll lead you around. And, you know, I, I was doing a dance class uh, in some hippie town recently, a friend of mine, kind of hippie person. And, and <laughs> And they were practicing the woman leading the man, the man leading the woman, and the woman, leading, and and the women wanted to lead the men. I said, "This is so crazy. <laughs> this is what this is. We're, we're dancing in order to stimulate the ideal hormones. The ideal hormones for women is depending on a man or a partner to lead you. That's the point of it. Not to be leading a man. You start feeling like a mother, and that's what will happen in an intimate relationship if you go too much into the leading part. But you you train." In a sense, you're not leading him when you say, here's three things I'd like to do, you pick. See, you're saying you pick, you decide, you decide. Whenever you get a guy to decide, good. And little tricks as well as, should I wear, if you're married, <laughs> should I wear white or black? <laughs> and I, I remember my wife, she uses, I say, oh, wear, wear, wear the black. She goes, oh, I think I'm gonna wear white. Why do you ask? You know, this is the point of men. And I know why she asks. It takes, you know, it's nice to be able to get points of view and your mind becomes clearer. But as a way to build intimacy, if he says wear white, you ask. It means both are possibilities. Wear what he says. The whole evening, he'll feel like he's your designer. He'll take credit for you. He'll, oh, I did that outfit. You know, he'll feel good. He'll feel more connected. Anytime a man has to take responsibility for you, he feels more connected to you. Anytime you are responsible for him, he will lose connection for you or have less connection with you. And, and you will... I think this is so profound, John, what you're saying here. I think it's so powerful and so important, especially for those of us, myself included, for many years I was single. I've now been married for 13 years, but I felt like I had to do everything by myself. And transitioning into marriage was a big adjustment for me. I've learned a lot of things over the last 13 plus years. But learning how to let my husband win, kind of setting him up to win, Yes. Has been one of the most profound things that I've I've had the privilege of learning in our marriage. I can remember once early on I had asked him to do something and then I was like looking over his shoulder, talking coming back to this control thing. I was looking over his shoulder and giving him a few tips on how I thought he should be doing it better. And he turned to me, you'll laugh at this, he turned to me and he said, You can either tell me what to do or how to do it, but not both. <laughs> 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 that's very cute that's very cute 
So well, over the years, I've learned more how to set him up to win. I kind yeah. of think of it like a basketball analogy where maybe I'm like the guard dribbling the ball down the court, but I'm going to pass it off to him because he's closer into the to the basket and he gets to make that basket. But because we're on the same team, we both win. He wins. He gets the credit for the basket because he put the basket in. And but you're part I win. Of the team. See, that's the beautiful thing about women. They can they have the awareness, the inclusiveness to feel that. You know, if I do something, it's a feather in my hat. If I do something for my wife, she will say to her friends, it's a feather in her hat. Yes, my husband did that for me. You see, it's like we get the feather in our hat is different. And always we did that is a thing that increases estrogen in women and in men, as opposed to I did that. And I did that as a testosterone producer. And I understand, you know, there's a place for women to be in their testosterone world. I'm not against that at all. It's just, it gets too much. It's finding that balance. And to find that balance, it doesn't feel real or authentic. It doesn't feel like me. Once you're over on your testosterone world, it feels unnatural to go back to your female side. There's a, it's, you're, you're going against the momentum. See, there's a momentum mm. when you're on that male side. And to turn it around is like turning around a big ship. You know, it doesn't just flip back. It takes practice, it takes intention, and it takes feeling awkward. It feels uncomfortable sometimes. It feels, this doesn't feel like me. That's why lots of women, when they hear me talk about men are from Mars, women are from Venus, they say, well, I feel like I'm from Mars and I'm not that woman you talk about. I say, yeah, she's inside of you. You just haven't found her. And to uh -huh. find her is not going to feel like you until you get there. And once you get there, you go, oh, this feels like home but it yeah. will take a while. But, you know, if you've never had permission to be there, that's a big deal, you know, our society today. Uh, if, if your mother did not have permission to be there, you won't have permission to be there as a little girl. And, you know, huge, all, you know, so many problems in the world today, but one of them is, is um, well, it's not about our topic, but I'll just toss it in. I wrote a whole book called Boy Crisis. Uh, these boys are growing up into men and they're just not gonna be good partners. Um, boys are uh, twice as many women today are graduating from college than men. Just look at that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, and, and, you know, all this stuff about how women get underpaid, actually women under 35, okay, they're a different genre. They went to college, they have college degrees. Women under 35 compared to men under 35, women make 20% more than men for the same job. Well, because I know it. I have all these women working for me. Women are harder workers. They're, they're, they don't have all of the problems that men have when it comes to work. You see, if a man fails at work, he has failed his male side, his testosterone goes down. If a woman fails at work, her testosterone goes down, then she needs more help. Her estrogen goes up and actually doesn't have the same disastrous effect on him as it has on a woman. So women are more eager. I can try this. I can try this. I can do this. Uh, whereas a man, if he, if he has, uh, performance of, of a job is always measured you're accountable so you're being measured are you good enough to do the job now of course that's a pressure for women too of course but for men it stops them in their tracks because they need testosterone so if they anticipate failure i'm not good enough their testosterone goes down if a woman's not good enough and her testosterone goes down it still hasn't damaged the estrogen part of her it actually strengthens that by saying, I guess I need help. So women are much more eager and willing to receive help, whereas men want to do it themselves. Now it's got off the subject a little bit, but it might be helpful to someone. No, I think it's very, very helpful. And I think it's really, really important. And, and the awareness you're creating around this boy crisis, I think is really, really important for, you know, for future generations, the generations that are coming up. And I think, um, you know, it's it's really, really, I think there's a lot of confusion out there, even among older people or more mature people in terms of some of the gender roles and what women really want and expect from women. I mean, what, what women really want and expect from men. Yeah. Um, in speaking with men over the last few years, as I've interviewed a fair amount of men, I know there's some genuine confusion among some men about what women really want and expect from them. And so I think this, you know, it's a, it's a broader crisis. Certainly there's a boy crisis that you speak to in your book, but it's a broader crisis in the world. 
It's big time. But you, you just said something really, really appropriate to the goal of this conversation, which is uh, for many people listening, single women wanting to understand men better. Don't ask men so many questions like you would do a girlfriend. Hmm. Don't let him talk more than you. Don't let him talk. You'll see that if you're still single, you ask too many questions. And mm. just let him clam up, uh, uh, you know, ask a few questions. Make sure that if you ask him, a, if there's nothing happening, you can always ask a question. Get a short answer. As soon as he gives any answer, immediately say something like, well, that's a good idea. That makes sense. Or really, that's so interesting. And then start talking. That, you know, that's called priming the pump. Sometimes you can't. <laughs> You can't get the water up there. You stick a little water in. Get him to talk a little bit, then change the subject back to you. The problem is women want to have the connection. There's two ways to connect. One is to go into him or he goes into you. Your job, women, is to get him to come into you. That's called attract him in, bring him in, open up, let him see you, let him come into you. That's where he will bond. If you go into him, he will not bond with you and you will not be satisfied with him. Mm. And, and then it goes also another thing it does besides dissatisfaction, it's also going to and activating this uh, bias towards negativity. Uh, it will also put him in the friend zone where you just can't feel any physical attraction to him. And I mentioned before that sometimes the right man for you is going to feel like the friend zone. So don't do anything to encourage the friend zone. Uh, basically, this is the guy who's more interested in you than you're interested in him. He's your gold mine. He's to retrain your brain that you are safe in the presence of a man. You don't have to seek to please him. You let him please you. And you can practice how to ask for help. You can practice giving him three things. This is what I'd like you to You pick. Here's three things I'd like to do. You pick. Practice not trying to change him in any way. Practice not having sex right away unless you just can't stand it and you want to have it. But it should be not to change him. It should be for you. See, many women feel so burnt because they had sex with a guy and he doesn't call back. And I go, why does it hurt? Well, you know, he didn't call back. I said, so you were expecting more from him. You see, mm -hmm. if you have sex, is you're basically saying, okay, if we have sex, take this back a few years. If you have sex, you have to marry me. <laughs> I mean, this is still some deep conditioning inside, you know. It's like, what? We had sex. You owe me, you know. If you have sex with men, it shouldn't be a man owes you anything. It should be you are having sex because he's already given you everything that you want to open yourself up. That's when sex is great. And he will enjoy sex more if it's not, if it's not like um, you're doing it for him. Sex should be for you. If sex is for you, it's because you needed it and you like it and you love it. And then he will love you more. So that's the wisdom of waiting. But today with so much pressure, you know, uh, and particularly if you're dating the right guy for you, if you have this pattern of dating the wrong men, then if it's the right guy, you're not going to really feel that warmth yet. Uh, so, and he's going to probably be too shy <laughs> to put the moves on, but if he does make the moves, it, there's so much pressure on men to like have sex right away in a relationship. Then you, you basically, if you're kissing and making out, you just say, Oh, this feels so good. And he says, yeah. And he wants to go further. You say, Oh, I like to go really slow. And he'll feel like, what? You know, it's like a failure to him. Then you, you support him at that moment. You say, oh, I would love to have sex with you. It's just I need to go slow. I can't wait. Then his ego is satisfied, you know, and it is an ego thing, and they all have it. And uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, to have sex, and the sooner you have sex for many, many men uh, is a sign of uh, he's Superman kind of a thing. It's a testosterone booster. But also the same testosterone booster is, I like to go slow, but I really can't wait till we do that. That's exciting to me. I want to do that. So, and then you don't have to do it later. You can change your mind, you know, but, but right. do something so you just, just knock down his ego with rejection. And, uh, and typically that guy who's pursuing you, uh, who's available to you, he might be, and if you're a very independent woman, he's going to be maybe... Uh, in some cases, quite commonly, he is sort of a shy, sensitive type, uh, more on his female side, so to speak. When men are more on their female side, they're more connected with their emotions, and so they're going to feel more intimidated. They're in touch with fears. The guys here have no intimidation at all. They're on their male side. You know, they don't have any emotions. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'll just go do this and do this. You know, and that you toughen up. That's all masculine energy. 
And what you want, typically, if you're an independent woman, you want a man who's going to be uh, on both sides, okay, to a certain extent. Uh, and they're, they're the ones who are trainable. You, you know, one level, I remember when Oprah just started out, I don't know, this vision came to me. I remember, I've done a lot of Oprah shows, but I remember when she just started out, maybe a year into her show, she was standing there and talking about uh, – what do women want, you know? And, and, and she got all excited when she when somebody said, yeah, we want a real man. We want, and so Oprah goes, yeah, a real man, a real man. And it's kind of like, well, what is that real man? And then she says, yeah, he'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, what real men took Oprah? <laughs> you know? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, there's a, you know, you don't have to have somebody be so powerful, they sweep you off your feet. If you're already a powerful woman, you need to bring yourself to your vulnerable part, which depends on someone. And generally, the more powerful man is, uh, I won't say this, it, it just, I just, typically there's going to be more attraction between somebody who's in their female, a man on his female side needing to go to his male side is a good fit for a woman who's on her male side needing to go to her female side. For the guy who's really on his male side, he needs to have a woman who's really on her female side. Okay, and so they'll come together. Uh, and, and because he's there, she'll feel safe and her male side will come forth as she appreciates him more. As he takes care of her, his heart softens because she's so vulnerable and dependent on him. He becomes a better person. So always there needs to be this sort of complementarity. You have to be compliments in some way for there to be an attraction. Some gain has to be there. So if you're a woman and you're on your male side, you're, you need to come back to your female side, but you want to keep your male side. You don't want to push that away. That's a beautiful part of you. And so you're going to find a guy who's on his female side who needs to come over to his male side and you just train him. He's the easiest one to train and he'll be the safety place for you to ask for help, to express how you feel, to make mistakes. You can make all the mistakes in the world. You get a guy who's way on his male side and you make mistakes, they tend to get angry. Mm. Uh, but the, the sensitive guys also can get angry too. That's the problem for all men today is that we have a culture that's embraced anger as some sort of therapy of benefit. Uh, a real man is taught, you know, when I teach men how to be men, you never, ever talk if you're angry, particularly if a woman's there. You're cool, calm, and collected. And if you are angry, you take a time out. And so I'm saying now to the women who are dating, if your man is angry about something, don't ask questions. Don't get him to talk more. Uh, not a good thing. Just, you know, take your timeouts. Take your timeouts. Change the subject. Don't pursue something. U ultimately, here's your fail safe. Okay, now this is a manipulation that's as old as women <laughs> and men coming together. <laughs> it's the oldest manipulation, which sometimes you have to use a manipulation at the, at the nth degree, which is, and actually it's, it's really being authentic too. And that's, you're right, I'm wrong. You say that to a man, you'll calm him down. It's a fail safe, just as a fail safe. You don't use it often, but uh, now the truth is, any woman who has a complaint about a man comes to me in the office, within 20 minutes of hearing the whole story, I can tell her 10 mistakes she's made. Mm -hmm. He's wrong too. He's wrong for sure. He did all this blah, 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 blah. But so is she. And she doesn't see it. That's why women need to research Beyond Mars and Venus. My book explains how women on their male side make all these mistakes. Because in that book, you'll see how you have contributed to the problem. I truly have experienced the innocence of women where they don't even, some women know how they create problems. Some women consciously do it, but only after they unconsciously created problems. They don't realize how they unknowingly sabotage relationships by giving men what women would want and not what men need are not realizing the significance of like a complaint. Why complain? Complaining doesn't even work. You know, women complain, he did this, this, this. And I said, oh, did he change? No, he didn't change. Now you're <laughs> complaining about that. That's good. Complaining doesn't work. Well, how do I get him to change? And then you want to step on his foot back. No, you find love not dependent on him. That's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your happiness comes from your life. So you're not dependent on him to be happy. He can't make you unhappy because you're already happy. All he can do is make you happier. But having said that, men can make you unhappy by interfering with your process to become happy. 
Okay, so let's say my wife's unhappy and she wants to talk and I keep telling her she's wrong for being unhappy. That will make her more unhappy. So men can make you unhappy without a doubt. But your job is to stay away from them. Disengage from depending on a man to make you happy. Do what you have to do to raise your estrogen levels and make your happiness. Then go back from that place and use new skills I talk about in my book to ask what you want and get it. And there's a lot of skills there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that book, Beyond Mars and Venus, right? That's the book you're just referring to right there. Yep. And so just a couple of recap things, John, that have really stood out for me from our conversation today. Um, first of all, you said that a woman can't even fall in love unless her estrogen levels are at a certain level. So yep. this balance... This balance, and you gave us some great examples of some things that a woman can do to support her uh, estrogen levels, some of the things that she can do to fill up her life and feel good and, and get that 80% that you're talking about, right? Yeah. That 80% happiness. And then um, you're also saying that if, if there's been a pattern of like some unhealthy attractions, uh, like maybe chemistry-driven attractions that haven't gone so well, that the right man for you might actually be someone that you don't feel super attracted to in the beginning. Physically attracted to. Physically attracted to, but he treats you really well. He's, he's, he's into you. He wants to get to know you and put that effort in and that sort of thing. And I believe in those kind of situations, sometimes the attraction can grow for a woman, right? When she starts to feel and see how this man shows up for her over a period of time. Like, I think there's few things that are more sexy than a man that's really there for you over a period of time, having right. experienced that in my own marriage. Yeah, we are so different as men and women in that way. Women start in the head, then they go to the heart when he does things for her. Conversation stimulates the mind, okay? With different points of view, but not trying to control me. And that's another dating skill. Always have different points of view from a man if you do. And you can fully and freely express them as long as you're not expressing them with the intention and the motivation to change his point of view. That's the whole mm -hmm. dynamic. It's very refreshing to be with somebody who says, yeah, I have a different point of view on that one. I think like this, but I can see why you would say that. That makes sense. You don't have to agree with somebody. You don't have to have the same point of view. And actually it's the fact that you're authentic makes you sexy, makes you attractive to someone as well as you're different. That's why I stress the importance of, women coming back to their female side, men coming back to their male side and the, finding their balance because then you can have attraction. But if you're on your male side, you can't feel, you're not attractive to a man over time. Maybe right away you are because there's a little trick here, which is when women are on their male side, they often are more open and liberal around sex. Okay, that's the male side. is less goal-oriented, let's have sex. So you feel... Uh, you don't feel so vulnerable when you have sex. You see, more on your female side, you feel more vulnerable when you're having sex. You're, it's vulnerability. So if you feel less vulnerability, you know, it's kind of like you've got uh, fake boobs. Hey, feel my boob. It's fake. <laughs> it's not really me. You know, I mean, so, some woman said, look, feel how good it is. Yeah, I'm like, Wait, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, if it's your actual boob, then you feel vulnerable. But it's a fake boob. Like, yeah, look at my boobs. See how good it looks? Touch it. See? Feels good. So it doesn't have that same feeling of vulnerability. So when women are on their male side many times, they, they don't have that, that vulnerability. They're more uh, assertive. They know what they want. They go after what they want. And a shy guy will kind of go, oh, I, you know, she wants to have sex. I don't have to initiate it. She'll, she'll come to me. So you'll, you'll tend to, um, if you're on your male side, you'll tend to feel attraction to men who are more on their female side, but then you'll lose interest because they stay on their female side. Okay. You'll, you'll mm -hmm. feel like their mother after a while. You'll start trying to control them and change them and so forth. And it won't feel good. That's what I hear a lot from women who get in these relationships. The man will become very passive. Uh, he won't make a commitment. He's not that interested, but he enjoys you being uh, sexually aggressive. That's, you know, every man deep down inside wants a woman to want him. Why? Because when a woman feels really safe and her estrogen levels shoot up really high, that's when you feel really safe and you feel I can depend on this person, then at that point, your testosterone levels spike. Why is that? Because 
you, it, well, first of all, that's your biology. Whenever a woman ovulates, her testosterone spikes. Her estrogen goes to the highest level when she ovulates. Then the testosterone spikes to say, go out there and get pregnant. Okay? It's like, now I can be pregnant. Now I can go out there and get pregnant. But when that testosterone spikes, it doesn't uh, lower her estrogen too low. It keeps it very high. It will lower it. Testosterone lowers estrogen. So when that testosterone spikes, her estrogen will start to come down a bit, but she's still at the high, high double, double level, 20 times higher than a man's when she has that climax. And her testosterone is not near close to a man's, but it's much higher than it normally is for her. And the studies show that. Uh, that's how you can know if a woman's ovulating is <laughs> you can see the hormones changing. So this is also, we, we, are, we are animals, okay? People have to get that. We have all these biological urges and attractions and feelings and needs and so forth. And, and then we've got this little person in the driver's seat right up here in our forehead. And he can be a pessimist or an optimist. And you can control that. First of all, you have no control over it if you're in a fight or flight response. Uh, so how do you get out of fight or flight responses? Fight or flight response will lower blood flow to the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And uh, adrenaline will activate your pessimism or your optimism. But then when adrenaline turns into cortisol, it's a two-step process, little stress, big stress. Once it's big stress, then no blood flow goes to the front part of the brain and you're just a conditioned animal. And you could say you're a human animal because uh, your conditioning came from your parents, what they did when they were stressed, but they learned what they did when they were stressed by what their parents did when they were stressed, who learned from their parents, who went from their parents, all the way back to when they were all monkeys. And so this is this tendency. It's all in all of us. We just have to see ourselves for what we are, but know that we're more than that. But we're only more than that when we have blood flow to the front part of the brain. And that's for women or men where we're only 20% dependent on our partners for happiness we can pretty much stay in that zone of I'm dependent on my level of happiness. And everybody's level of happiness, by the way, is different. We have a different set point of what our level of happiness is, which doesn't change unless you change it. And that's what you, there are things you can do to change it, which are my books on, and other courses and various things on, on healing the heart, you know, healing the past traumas and healing that and becoming more open and more loving and more receptive. But we're focusing mainly on dating skills today. Uh, on, on Wednesdays on Facebook Live, I talk about processes for healing the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesdays, I talk about relationship skills. On Mondays, I talk about meditation. All these things I think are very, very important. Um, Somebody said to me, why are you teaching meditation? You're such a good relationship teacher. And I said, because I can. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and also I know that one of the gifts of having a healthy relationship and growing in love is the ability to not depend on find your partner for your love. And, and one form of love is self-love. And that comes from inside. And meditation uh, is one wonderful technique to forget your problems and go inside to a place which is... It's like going deep into the ocean. There's no longer any waves, but you're going deep into a stillness mm -hmm. in your heart. And meditation for men and women is different. For women, it ideally, it's a guided meditation with music or in a group, a guided meditation in a group. And for men, it's often quiet, silence, completely forget everything. And then you can also do guided meditations for both men and women because men are now more feminine. But when I learned meditation 50 years ago in India, you did it alone. You did it in the woods. You did it by the river. You did it quietly. You know, it's the thing you do inside. And yoga, yoga classes, mostly women do yoga classes today because you're doing it in a group and you're doing it to music and you have a leader telling you what to do. As a yogi, you go out in the woods, you do it yourself. You know, nobody's bossing you around. You got one connection with the, the, with the higher self. So meditation is also a really great thing for estrogen, the kind I just mentioned Guided meditations are really good for women's estrogen levels and learning yoga meditation technique as well as exercise and weightlifting. All these things are good for testosterone. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that, John. And for, for the women that are listening and may not know about all of the things that you offer, is the very best place for them to go is to go to marsvenus.com. Tell us, tell us how they can access the, these Facebook lives and everything that you're talking about? Well, you go to marsvenus.com and 
I do blogs, really well-produced blogs on relationships. Um, one thing I want to mention for your group, which is uh, my daughter, who's 34, she's a master of this, Lauren Gray. She does blogs there, but she also has an online six-week course uh, that women can check out. It's called uh, How to Get Me Time. And she has a system called You Time, Me Time, We Time that she teaches in there. And maybe the title of it is a little misleading because a lot of women who are single think, uh, I have plenty of me time, that's all I have. And actually, you don't. Uh, <laughs> what you want is to be able to be in a relationship and balance the we time with your me time. And how to ask for help is a major part of this course. So eventually it will be retitled or redone uh, just in terms of the title, which is the feel good woman. That's what it's really about. But if you go online, it's a class that she teaches six week class, how to, how to get me time really, really good. And what she told me, well, I also participate sometimes in it too. And she said, it's amazing, dad, you tell them this and then they don't do it. You tell them this and they do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so what you get is you get to see, uh, you know, it, it, instead you get all these quizzes and you get exercises to do. So it's, it's, that's a real work, a work class to do, but it's really worthwhile. Highly recommend how to get more me time. And I don't know, I just started my new Facebook live thing. So I think if you go to, if you search John Gray, Mars, Venus, John Gray, Mars, Venus on, on FaceTime, you'll, you'll see me. I do it Pacific time, 10 o'clock, uh, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Thursday is success principles and Friday is romance, dating, and sex. So we've talked a lot about dating today. So that's the kind of stuff I talk about on Friday and take people's questions and so forth. So it's a new thing for me. I hope everybody will join me there. That would oh, be really yeah. fun. You know? That's great. It's wonderful you're doing that, John. It's so generous of you to be putting out that content on a daily basis. And I know because, you know, you and I have been connected for the past few years. I'm on your email list and I see your emails come out about your Facebook lives. And so I think if people go to your website and get on the email list, they'd start yes. getting some notification as well. Well, I'm that's just, a great idea. Thanks for helping me so I answer that question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And we're going to put links to your website and some of these things below this interview as well, because I want to, I want people to get the help that they need. And I, you know, I've seen some of your daughter Lauren's video blogs and things like that. And she does a wonderful job. She's very charming and is also giving really, really fantastic advice. And so um, I do know because I'm on the email list that I receive those things. So I think that would be important for people that are listening to get on the email list and then they would receive those notifications. So we'll definitely put links underneath this video that people are watching or listening from so that they have access to that. Or you can just go to MarsVenus.com directly. So uh, one thing I want to say, I really enjoy doing your, your working, working with you and um, I, I did. I just did my second Facebook Live today. Okay, so uh, today I asked for comments and questions, and 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 responses, and it just made my day. The first day, I just gave this talk, and there wasn't anybody that I was hearing from. Nobody was writing any comments, or I didn't know where to find the comments. And I was just so bummed out afterwards. Normally, I feel great after my presentations, and I realized it's this male thing, the male part of us, and also a female thing too. But needs to have feedback. So if anybody comes to my Facebook Live, please say hello. And uh, you can ask questions, you can make comments, and it just means the world of difference to me. So if I'm helpful to you, please do that for me, and you'll get more from me. It's amazing to just see the difference of getting that feedback. And I just know if women could understand when they're in relationships with men, anytime it's truthful, to make a comment like, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that was so helpful. Oh, you know, when you say that, it makes me think of this and this and this, and I could do that. Anytime you can give a message to a man on a date where he says something and it opens your consciousness, your awareness to looking at the world differently and giving you, in a sense, you feel a positive response, articulate it. Because sometimes you think he doesn't need to hear it. That's a really key thing. And just as men often don't realize how much women need to hear. I love you. You're special. You're beautiful. Hugging you, being attentive to you. The little things make a big difference. And men just don't know the power of that. 
And the flip side of that is women don't know the power of the little expressions and appreciations and comments uh, that a woman can make. And it makes all the difference in terms of a male bonding with a woman and for her to feel her estrogen levels rising. So you give 50 roses to a woman with low estrogen, you might get a little tiny estrogen response. One rose will produce the same response and then one rose many, many times will get you up to a healthy level where 50 roses or one rose has the same effect. See, that's the, that's the place of a woman being centered in herself. 80% of her happiness is within herself. And it's, you know, at COVID, during the COVID time, there's so much unhappiness in some couples. Some couples are thriving in it because they have good communication skills. They know how to give each other space. Uh, they're not so needy or dependent on each other for their happiness because the 80-20 rule is 80% of your happiness needs to come not dependent on your partner. Then your partner has the power to take you to 100 quite easily. And if, if, if you don't have your 80%, your partner, whatever they say or do, is just going to be dissatisfying. It's not going to be up to standard. And so then you feel resistance and resentments and you lose your attraction to them. All these arguments and fights will start to happen. And so this is happening because couples are not understanding that. And a practical way to understand this is not that I have all these things in my life that make me happy. I have all these things in my life that might even be stressing me. But in that moment, I'm having to come back to a mindset that brings me happiness or at least evenness. For example, I'm rushing to the airport and I have to say to myself, it's going to be okay. You have plenty of time. You see what I did just then? I'm being responsible for my happiness. Oh, now I have to wait in this long line. You'll get on the plane. Don't worry about it. You'll get there. Then you kind of go get on the plane. You go, oh, that person's got a better seat than me. And what a bummer. Why do they get that? And they go, oh, but I saved money by getting this seat. So we're constantly telling ourselves things all the time to come back to our state of happiness. We don't realize it. But this is our mindset all the time. We're doing this, taking responsibility to various degrees, depending on how happy you are as a person. Then you come to your partner. It's very easy to not project onto them blame or dissatisfaction. You're already in this habit of constantly taking responsibility and you're at this happy level, then what they say or do can make you happier. And if they don't say or do something, then you're in the habit of taking responsibility for your own happiness. You know, this is, this is uh, such a powerful thing that can happen when we're not depending on our partner all the time for happiness. And during the COVID time, when people can't go out and go through all those little stresses of the day, constantly being stressed, having to come back, having to come back, having to come back, then you're, you don't have that then you're just having all these stresses and they're all about your partner. They're all about your house. They're all about your children. <laughs> and, and we're so used to them being able to make us happier, we blame them. So anytime we're blaming our partner, we should realize we're kind of like drunk. Uh, we're, we're out of balance. Uh, we're overreacting. It's not real. And then if we have arguments and fights, a bad part of your partner comes out and often we think, oh, that's the real person. They showed me their true colors. No, they showed you who they become when they're out of balance. Mm. And that's not so who they profound. are. So profound. Yeah. yeah. And, and this awareness that you're creating, John, with your work is so powerful because instead of just kind of being in the monkey brain, you know, the monkey brain, we get to, we get to be, have a different level of awareness so we can approach these situations and these communications from a place of choice rather than just default, what the default setting might be. Yeah, nicely said, nicely said. Yeah. You know, I have to tell you what I love about doing interviews with you, and not all interviewers do it, is you're able to sum up and, and, and point out the, the, the takeaways from what I say. It's very valuable to everyone listening and to me. Thank you. Oh, John, thank you so much for saying that. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to share your wisdom and advice with the women out there because I know over the years that I've been able to be in contact with you, it's made a huge difference for so many women. I've received so much wonderful feedback and I really appreciate your generosity and the way you show up because you always give so generously of the things that you know that can share, that you can share that make a difference in people's lives. So I just really respect that and appreciate that about you as well. And thank you so much for your kind words and generosity.
And I know you had six or seven more questions. We can do that at another time. I'm happy to do it. Thank you so much, John, and uh, really appreciate your time and your generosity. And I uh, wish you all the very best and, and really appreciate the opportunity to connect again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.